Can you stand up, Pastor Dad? Can you stop it here so you can get high with me? In the early service, Faith had a baby doll, so I had to hold a baby doll. Okay. <laughs> can you shake here, Pastor Dad? Okay. Can you do like a, like a soul shake like this? Okay, I'll shake right like that. Okay. I had a picture in uh, Facebook of my friend, but our hands are a little different shape. Um, our skins, so everybody's skin is a different shape. But I had a friend in um, Facebook that was a black guy and a white guy. Uh, one of my friends, he had clasped hands with the, and he had that up as his post, I think, after Charlottesville. And it's a reminder that it's not the shade of our skin, but we're all the same on, in, on the inside. We're all made in God's image. We should always remember that, right? Can you give me a good shake? Oh, it's a good one. <laughs> All right, let's uh, do the prayer hug with Bob here. Can everybody put your hands on? And uh, if you'll do the actual prayer with us. Dear Lord, Dear Lord help, me help me to see every person, to see every person, person in, your in your image. And help me, and help me to love them, to love them and, lead them and lead them closer to you. Closer to you. Amen. Amen. Kids in town and the black kids in town were being merged into one high school called T.C. Williams High School. And because of that, uh, Boone Washington was the black fellow and he became the head coach and Will Patton, who had been the head coach, became the assistant. And they, from that real incident, they produced the movie Remember the Titans. And if you have younger kids that haven't seen that, they ought to really Take the time you want to watch that as a family and let it teach you the lesson that, that it holds. And ironically, when our daughter was up at uh, Edinburgh University, we went for a student body talk, and it was Ashley Boone Washington and Will Patton, the two actual coaches from Virginia, some now 40 years later, and they were still friends, and they were going around the country showing others that there's answers to these racial questions and uh, issues that we go through. So where is the answer to the what and why of Charlottesville? We find in James chapter 4, it's a lengthy passage, but it deals with it. And let me go through it for you. And this is the old King James Version, but it has a beauty to it, and I think you can capture what's being said. And, uh, and so James, uh, the earthly half-brother of Jesus, asked the question, <laughs> from whence come wars and fightings? Where did come, where did Charlottesville come from? And it says, come they not hence even from your lusts that war in your members. That's the struggle in our own hearts. Ye lust and have not, ye kill and ye desire to have, and ye cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. And you ask, and receive not because you ask amiss, the wrong way, that ye may consume it upon your own lust or desires. It's strong language. Ye adulterers, adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do ye think that the scripture say in fame, and most translations say this, that the Holy Spirit dwelleth in you and is jealous for us. Love is after envy. Verse 6, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, mourn, and weep, let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Speak not evil of one another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother, and judges his brother, speaketh evil of the law, and judges the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. 
Who art thou that thou judges another? So what transpires in a place like Charlottesville or Barcelona where the evil side of a, a religion comes to bear where for many blocks someone chooses to take out innocent lives? Um, such great uh, stress in and why do we continue to have this uh, racism, party differences, class differences? I mean, I, I even hear being that we're more rural, you know, you'll know people. Well, you know those city people, right? And if you're in the city, you'll go, ah, those country people. So maybe you got to take the time to get to know a person from the country or no person from the city. Or know a black person or an ordinary person, maybe you would begin to form different views of them. And or at least you would uh, challenge to lead them towards God. So so what is the answer then to the strife in Charlottesville and the strife in Barcelona and the strife in on the internet between Republicans and Democrats? And uh, it all comes down to the strength inside you. That's the war that matters. That's what James was claiming here. He said, where do wars and fights come from? Do they not come from inside of you when you're at war with your members? There was a, uh, a little bit of a video shown recently. The leader of alt-right, the white supremacist group, he lives in a little town in Montana. And there was a previous skinhead who had turned away from his hatred towards other races and, and came to a knowledge that he, he, it was all from pains in his own life. And the leader of the, uh, the skinhead reformed now to try to lead people towards relationships with one another was speaking in the hometown of the alt-right leader there in Montana. And he called out the alt-right leader said, why don't you come to our meeting? And maybe we can have coffee afterwards. Well, who would have thought the guy actually showed up? The alt-right leader, the leader of the whole white supremacist movement under that name, the alt-right, came to the meeting and he listened to him and he said, how about we have some coffee afterwards? And they videotaped their conversation. And they didn't come to the same mind, but they agreed that they both were, had gone through a lot of internal pain. And from that, James chapter 4 has proven out that wars and strife among us come from the battles we have within us. The, the potholes in our own life cause us to be at strife with, with others. And when you think about this, I, I want to go through this rapidly, but hit you with it. There are, I usually have three point sermons, but this one is a four point error, so you get the next one. That all these words came to my mind was all started with the word S. And I think as we go through this, then God leads us to an answer of the what Charlottesville and, and why it happened and what, what is the biblical answer. Um, the first one is survey. Survey the situation. See, what we're most ready to do is survey the other person. Amen? Amen. Our mind's always on the other person, what they're doing. You hear, you know, you hear race, racial fights. It's all about the other race. What's happening in that race? If it's a political party, it's all about the other party, not the problem in your own political party. It's it's all about the other person rather than the person that matters biblically is yourself. Because James said, you ask for a divorce and fightings come. It comes from inside you. And and so we have to take a survey of the situation and search our hearts, search our own hearts, and by that, God can begin to show, give us the direction that we need to go. Now, I worked for a surveyor, a land surveyor, for quite some time, right after high school and college and seminary, I worked for a land surveyor that was, he was so much fun to work with, he was crazy. And I think I already told you about, he played a trick on me one time, he told me to go put a, some corner tape in, some flagging, they call it orange tape, up on a corner, uh, corner of a uh, property that we surveyed. And I said, 
Charlie, we already have someone there. And he said, am I the boss or are you the boss? <laughs> I said, okay, Charlie, you're the boss. And so I started up towards the corner with a round gold orange flagging. And, and I, I know I've already told the story. But out from the edge of a pool house stepped this guy. He wasn't very tall, but he was like this wide. And he had a cut-off shirt on. And I couldn't even count how many tattoos he had on his arm. He coming out of the dog this man. And he's walking right toward me. And he goes, he started with curse words, and that's never good, right? <laughs> he's cursing me, and then I'm like, he goes, Kid. and finally I heard property, and I go, this dude does not want me on his property, you know? And I've got this sort and I'm like, I'm just doing a survey here, sir. We're just trying to get some flagging up at that top corner. And he goes, I told you. And he starts going toward and I turned around, and I hightailed it back to the truck. And I told Charlie, I said, that dude's crazy up there. Charlie said, give me that tape. And he grabbed the flagging tape, and he starts marching up towards the corner. And I thought, oh, Lord, I'm going to have to call an ambulance. <laughs> He's walking up there. All of a sudden, the guy comes out from the pool, and he's still swearing. His arms, his muscles are bulging. And all of a sudden, Charlie starts running towards him. He said, I'm a land surveyor. I can do whatever I need to. And the other guy starts running to him, and I really was panicking. They bounced chest off each other and fell to the ground. They were high school buddies. <laughs> <laughs> they planned the whole trick. <laughs> they planned the whole thing on me. So I get to know that's the kind of guy, that's the kind of guy he was. But uh, once in a while, Charlie would, would get serious, and he'd say, let's get some work done, little buddy. Let's get going. And so two things with the survey. You, you almost often have to go to the courthouse to do a deed search. And you could be all kinds. It could be a lot of bad deeds, but there's one deed that's closest to the truth. It has the right corners, the right distances, the right angles. So you have to go and get a good deed, and then you can go do a good survey. I think that's symbolic of you and I. God is asking you to do a good deed search of your heart and soul so that you and God know what's going on there. And then you'll be able to better survey your situation. Why are you reacting to other people as you are? Is it possible that some of the struggle is the fight inside you? How can a white person who doesn't even know a black person scream at the top of their lungs how much they hate them and they don't even know? How can, I think it's Akafa or something like that, how can you have liberal white kids trained in the best colleges, covering up their faces with black masks, putting hoods over there, and throwing rocks and food, you know, at someone just because they have a Trump hat? There's something wrong in our country, amen? And it's inside of us. You, do, you need to do a good search, a deep search inside you, and let God survey you for the situation. And that's why the Bible says, search me, O God, and know me, my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me. See if the struggle's in me. I have a good friend that was a pastor down in Florida, in a large community of Florida. His name's Jorge Acevedo. And um, he was going towards the Publix, you know, they have the grocery store, the Publix change. So he was going for this Publix store, and as he was going, he said, up above all the cars and everything, he said, I could see five or seven big black men, black, you know, you could see their shoulders, great big tall guys standing right at the, the door. And Jorge said, I got this sick feeling in my gut. Because I knew I was going towards that cold door. And then he's mad at himself. He's saying, I'm a pastor for 30 years. Why do I have a sick feeling in my gut when I happen to see five? Five to seven black kids. And as he got closer, they were all dressed nice. They were all members of a sports team. They were there by permission, collecting money for their team. And Jorge said, Here I am, in his faith, he said, I've been called a wet back in the spit, and I'm judging other people. You know, I'm, I'm racial, racist towards other people. So we need to do a, a, a real survey of our lives. That's where the the battle starts. And then we need to surrender. Uh, verse 4 says, and it's very strong words here, adulterers, adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. You can't be a white supremacist and be a true practicing Christian. 
You can't be a member of an ultra violent leftist group and be, fall, be a follower of Jesus Christ. Amen? You know, it may be hard for you. You may have had a lot of bad experiences, but you cannot do this. Because if you do this, you're an adulteress. You're saying that the, the thoughts of the world are more important to you than the thoughts of God. The thoughts of the world are more important to you than the thoughts of God. And that may be a tough thing for some of you to hear, but, you know, we all need to hear it. Because we all have to, we all have to surrender, you know, ourselves. And, and then and the reason why it says is, verse 5 says, if you're a Christian, or you think that the scripture says that the spirit who dwells in us Jealously. The Holy Spirit walks inside of us. He's jealous for us. Isn't it to know that God is jealous for you? He doesn't want you to go the wrong direction, to head down the wrong road. He's jealous for you. And in a holy jealousy, holy, a righteous jealousy, he, he wants us to come to Him and to be His only. You know? And, and the way we do that is surrender. You know, we all sing the hymn, I Surrender All. It's not easy to do. It? You can sing the words, but it's hard to actually to live out, to do. And, and we need to be able to surrender everything to God. I heard about a guy, uh, I read about a guy that he was at work, and he was going by some of the seats at work, and he noticed a full blunt of marijuana sticking out from the seats. Just barely lit, and then someone tucked it back in there. And 30 years ago, it rushed back to him that that was his go-to. That was his go-to for peace. Is he grabbed a joint, smoked a joint, and that was his go-to for peace. He said he grabbed some of that joint, and he said, I refuse to let 30 years of victory go over my school. He took that blunt and he threw it into a pile of wet garbage, and he stole it. <laughs> God bless him, huh? Amen. He surrendered. He finally surrendered. And you know, this is what he said. This is a good word for anyone you know, or for all of us that are struggling with temptations. He said, he said, I keep, God has taught me to keep any temptation at more than arm length away. If you keep a temptation only at arm length away, you'll most likely take hold. But if you keep any temptation more than an arm length away, God can, can get you through. And when we, when we surrender to God, when we surrender, then finally we can submit. We, when we surrender to God, then the next step is we can submit to Him. I saw down in Georgetown in Roxbury, there was a church sign that said, God can fill the cup that's tipped up. You know, if your cup's turned over, God can pour all the grace and all the mercy upon you, but you'll get none. But if you tip your cup up, then as God pours his love and mercy out upon us, it fills up. Amen? It's overflowing. To overflowing. Why, why go through life unsubmitted to God and with our cups turned over and everything just runs over us and passes? And that, that relates to our relationship to God, but also in our relationship to other people. Once you start submitting to God, then you don't, you're not threatened by some of the different groups. You're not threatened by somebody from a different political party. You're not threatened by somebody who has a different view um, of this or that. Because we all have to submit to God. There's vast views of human sexuality. Now I'll say this straight out. Vast views of human sexuality. But finally we all have to submit to God. Amen? I, I'm not going to judge anyone, but finally they will have to submit to God, whether they were really going in the right direction, the direction that God wanted them to go in. Not the direction I want them to go in, the direction God wants them to go in. And, and so it is, and also in our relationship to other people, I love that verse, Romans 12, 21 says, don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Romans 12, 21, that's another transpose, easy one to remember. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome um, evil with good. And God heads us in a new direction. He, said, he says, cleanse your hands and purify your hearts. I think this is a word to us. You have to change what you do with your hands. 
Stop doing what you do with your hands because they affect your heart. Cleanse your hands and purify your heart. You know, both of those things have to happen for God to be heading us in the right direction. You know, somebody got to stop going to the, you know, they said in Boston that there were a lot of people there looking for a fight. How tragic, huh? We have so much to work on. Cleanse your hands and purify your hearts, having submitted yourself to God, that he might lift us up. If we go down, 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 he'll lift us up, up, up. But we have to humble ourselves before God. So we, we seek and survey, we surrender, we submit to God. And the last one I want to lift up is we see our brothers with new eyes. We do not speak evil of one another. That's a big one, isn't it? Verse 11, do not speak evil of one another, brother. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. We're just called to do the law. And the Bible even says there is one lawgiver, capital L, who is able to save and destroy. Who are you to judge another? We have to tell people, you're going to be this. You're going to be saved or destroyed on how you respond. It's up to you. And I think every one of us, you know, if you are in a destructive path, if you are in a destructive path, that path is going to end in destruction unless you go a different direction. And God graciously allowed you to go a different direction. You know? And and that's what, and, and then we, once God saved you, I'm going to ask you a question. If you felt forgiven of your sins, truly forgiven of your sins, have you found it easy to judge others or have you found yourself more merciful? Amen? Judy, all that you've been through, did you find yourself judging others or having great mercy for them? Great mercy. Great mercy. Because once we've been touched by God and forgiven by Him, we have great mercy for others. And we need to be able to not speak evil of others. I'm going to give you one Greek word here. The word do not speak evil of others is the word kata laleo. Compound word. Kata means down, and laleo means to speak proud. So the word means to speak down on someone, to speak hostily about someone, to speak deridingly about someone. That's half of social media, isn't it? Isn't that your kids now, huh? Yeah. How about being a different force, amen? But instead of kata and all that, how about upward speaking toward others? You can be a force, you can be a revolution for good by saying, why would you constantly be talking down to people when you should be lifting them up? And as I started out, I closed with Illustration from Remember the Titans. How many people have seen Remember the Titans? Oh my gosh. These, you guys did see it? Okay. Well, everybody needs to see it in your family, all right? Yep. It's good. It's a great movie because it has great lessons. I'm, gonna share, I'm not going to ruin the whole movie, but I'm going to share one, one part with you um, as we get come close to close. In one of the parts of the movie, there's this tension between the black members of the team and the white members. And Big Shu is one of the black members that's the, one of the best players. And Bert Tier is one of the white members that's the best player. And the team is just in shambles. So Bert Tier is the captain, and he thinks he's going to do some good. So he goes to Big Shu, and he says to him this big speech about, he said to him, he said, you're nothing. He said, you're nothing but a pure waste of time. And he said, because you just broke through the line. You don't touch anyone else. But you just think about yourself, or you're, if you're being sad. Push somebody, pull somebody. He said, but, but don't think about yourself. And Big Jew says, you want to talk about something? Let's talk, let's talk about the ways that you're the captain. You the captain? Uh, Big Jew, uh, Big T, uh, Bertier says, oh, that's right. Big Jew says, you got a job? Bertier says, I got a job. Big Jew says, you've been doing your job? Big Mercure says, I've been doing my job. Big Shoe says, 
then why don't you tell your white buddies to walk for Rep better? They haven't walked for him any more than worth a blood nickel, and you know it. Nobody plays, yourself included. I'm supposed to wear myself out for the team? What team? I'm going to think about myself. I'm going to do for myself. That's where the world is right now. Sadly, it's where our government is. That's where our relations in black and white, uh, relations between different people. We need to cross. If you, if you don't know someone of a different race, the next time that God has someone passionate cross your path of a different race, make an effort to, to say something to them. And I would say the same to a, a black person. Our one time was down in Washington, D.C., for a church meeting. And there's a lot of African American population there. I got into a bus, a city bus in Washington with one other guy. There was another pastor. Three black people got on. A black family got on. Five black guys got on. Four more black people got on. Another black family got on. All of a sudden, there was 47 black people and two white guys. I got a feeling of what they go through. Amen? We don't think about what they go through. But the sad thing was no one of those 47 people came and spoke to me. So I'd say the same thing to black folks as I would to white folks. We need to cross these barriers that are all around us. And I am thankful to know that Bertier, the big shoe, finally crossed that barrier. In the movie, I'll share with you one part of it. Bertier is badly injured in the car wreck. He's laying in the hospital. He, this was a fact about the real guy. He's paralyzed from the waist down. And he's laying there. And in comes Big Shoe, who they now are closest of friends. And the black guy comes in, and the nurse is standing there, and she looks right at the black guy. She says, only Ken is allowed in here. And Bertier says to her, Alice, are you blind? Can't you see the family resemblance? He's my brother. He's my brother. And you know, it's the true story. And the two coaches shared with us there in the room. And I think it's kind of in the close of the movie that those two men remained friends their whole life. And tragically, Bertier was actually killed in the motor accident. He was paralyzed when he was driving. And he was killed in the motor accident. And the black, black players and the white players came together as one family. You know, I pray that God can do that for America. But you know where it starts? With you. With your prejudices. With the battle going on inside of you. That's what it's supposed to be. We beg you to Dear Lord God, the what and why of Charlottesville is so difficult to understand, but help us to see that the battle truly is within us. That's where the wars and the struggles come, is that only the battle within us as we struggle to come to you, surrender our, surrender ourselves and submit ourselves to you that we might speak well to others. Let us be good with us of your love, truthful and honest, but good and loving witnesses. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.